Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to start in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 11. I'll read if you'll follow along. It says, And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to, cheat, to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But went, what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them which are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the messages and the lessons that we can get from it. I pray today that you would speak to our hearts. I pray you would encourage and strengthen us, dear Lord. I pray you would give us what we need. Help me to say what you have. Nothing more, nothing less. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We look at this character of John the Baptist, and we see John the Baptist described by Jesus. We see them talking about John the Baptist here in this passage. We put a, a photo. Of course, you know those photos from, of John the Baptist. You know, you dig those out of the archive. No, it's not a photo, obviously. And you know, it just he's an unusual character. He, he really is. Uh, he was unusual in his conception. We understand his elderly parents. You see in Luke chapter 1, the description around them, they were well stricken in years, the Bible says. And he was unusual in the announcement of his birth. Zechariah in the, the doing of his duties, if you will, in the temple, in his, the administration of his priestly duties, he saw this angel that told him what was happening. And because of his unbelief in that situation, he was mute during the pregnancy as the, the child John came. It was unusual in his upbringing. If you look at what was expected of him and what the scriptures laid out and how to raise John the Baptist, he was raised in an unusual way. He was separated in a very special way, dedicated from his infancy, the Bible talks about. He was unusual in his filling. He was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. That doesn't happen. <laughs> That's not how it happens for us. We're filled with the Holy Spirit, or we, should we say the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us when we as believers trust Christ as our Savior. But John the Baptist was unusual in his filling. We see he was unusual in his ministry. He preached and he baptized out in the wilderness. He didn't go where people were in the big cities or you know in the temples, but he preached in the wilderness. We see he was unusual in his dress and in his appearance. He was clothed with camel's hair, 
and a girdle of skin. I don't think any of us here have camel's hair on today. It's just unusual. Unusual in his diet. The scripture says that he ate locusts and wild honey. There's some health food for you. There you go. We see he was unusual in his boldness. Man, we see uh, how he lost his life. He called out the sin of that wicked king. And, and because of that, he lost his head. And he was unusual, not just in the way that he lived, not just in all these other areas, but in the results of his ministry as well. We see that many came to hear him from afar. Many were baptized with this baptism of repentance. And he fulfilled the task and the calling that God had given him. But it required an unusual life. John the Baptist was far from normal. I don't think that even, even we today, separated from his life by so many years, it's easy for us to kind of gloss over how unusual some of these characters are. But when we look at John the Baptist in the scripture, I don't think anyone looks at him and thinks, that was just a normal guy, you know. There he, no, he was an unusual, an unusual character. But here in this passage, especially at the beginning, we see the humanity of John the Baptist. He's in prison and he sends for assurance that Jesus was the promised Messiah. He says, is this, is this the one that, that I'm the messenger for, if you will? And he struggled while in prison. And of course, this is, this is he's in prison because of his boldness. He's in prison because he was serving the Lord in a great way and he still struggled with doubt while he was in prison. And Jesus, with compassion, gives him this assurance. He reminds him of the miracles. He reminds him of the signs. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 6 here, we see in this passage, he says, And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. He tells him, hey, John, he says, don't stop. He says, continue. Don't be offended. Don't, be, uh, don't stumble. Don't stop at this point. You've gone so far. The Lord, you've been used so much in, in what he has for you. Don't stop here. And John the Baptist, he was the herald of the Messiah. The scriptures call him the messenger right here. He foretold the coming of Jesus. He warned people. He preached repentance, and, and he preached that they prepare themselves. And as Jesus gives this assurance to John, as he sends back, I'm sure there were people that heard him giving this message that was passed back to him. As he gives this assurance here, Jesus turns to the multitude of his disciples that were looking on. And he asks them this question several times in several different ways. He says, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? He says, what did you expect of John the Baptist? It was clear that they had the wrong expectations. Maybe it was because of their expectations that were off, out of line for the Messiah. We see that there were times when they tried to take Jesus physically to make him into a political leader. They wanted to make him into a king. They saw that they thought that this Messiah was the one that was going to bring them a physical deliverance, a political deliverance from, uh, from the Roman Empire and the oppression that they were under. So they had a, a mistaken idea about this, this Messiah, and that probably set the wrong expectations for John as well. Maybe they were expecting what they had seen in a king's herald. Maybe someone dressed fancy. Maybe someone with no backbone just repeating the words without conviction, the words that, that he was given. But then they came to the wilderness and they experienced preaching with a capital P, you might say. They saw John the Baptist proclaiming the word of God, giving truth like they had never seen it before. And it wasn't what they expected. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 18, it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, it's talking about unbelievers, those that perish, foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the, of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both the Jews and, the, and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, 
and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things or things that are. They went out in the wilderness to hear John the Baptist. They were probably expecting something unusual, but what they found wasn't what they expected. And this bold proclamation of truth, that's not what the world expects today. This world expects the mincing of words. They expect us to be careful and, and cautious in our human expression. They expect us to tiptoe around difficult issues. They expect someone who dresses according to the way they want, it, they want a person dressed. They, want, they expect someone who's concerned about what they're concerned about. But God had something different in mind. He had John the Baptist, a fire-breathing evangelist who didn't care for the opinions of man. He didn't care how polished he came across or what he was dressed like or what they expected. He said, he must increase, I must decrease. And I'll say that when it comes to the ministry and the work of the Lord, he still has something different in mind. Our world has an expectation for what a believer is. And unfortunately, it's not based on the word of God. It's not based on truth. We don't have a society that knows the word of God like it used to. And their expectation is out of line. And God has something different than what the world expects. God expects us to be conformed to his image, not to the image of this world. And may we live according to his expectations. Jesus goes on here to then tell them that John the Baptist was exactly what he was supposed to be. He, he gives that stamp of approval, that affirmation. And what, what an affirmation that is. He says, that first part of that verse, among them that are born of women, there hath not raised, risen a greater than John the Baptist. And he goes on and puts it in perspective there. But man, what, what an affirmation. What, what a thing to say. <laughs> there, are still, there are still some people that aren't happy though. And, and that's the way it always will be with the world. When we serve the Lord, when we follow what he commands, there are gonna be people that aren't satisfied. They wouldn't be satisfied with God himself. And we see here that that's exactly what happened. Uh, as we look at this, Pat, we'll see here in just a minute. First Corinthians chapter two, it says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And the reality is that unbelievers will never fully understand spiritual matters. When we go and we knock on a door and we share the gospel with folks, you know, hey, there are some, some issues that will pop up, of course, in conversation. They're, they're going to be. But at the end of the day, we have to stay focused on the gospel because until the spirit of God indwells that man, he will not receive the matters that are spiritual. He's not going to understand, you know, why we choose the King James Bible. He's not going to understand the type of music we want to listen to. He's not going to understand the lifestyle that the Bible calls us to because he has not accepted Christ as a savior. And under, unbelievers will not understand spiritual matters until they know Christ. And here they were in this passage. We see them complaining about John and Jesus in this passage. I want to look at several of these criticisms, and, and we'll look at these complaints that are still in our society today. Number one, I see in verse 17, they complained that you didn't follow our emotions. You didn't follow our emotions. If you're taking notes in the in the bulletin there, that's emotions. Verse 17, verse 17 there, it says, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. He says here that, that, that there were some times we wanted you to be happy and excited. We, we piped, we played music, and, and you didn't dance. And then there were some times that we were sad, and we mourned. And we expected you to be sad like we were sad, and you weren't. You didn't follow our emotions. You weren't high when we were high, and you weren't low when we were low. And I'll tell you, we live in a society that listens to a piper. They listen to the same piper. And I think sometimes we don't even step back and take notice of the fact that, you know, you see everyone just all of a sudden go through these phases where all of a sudden everybody's worked up about one thing. And then, you know, the next week, there's the new thing. Everyone's supposed to be worked up about this. 
and then we move a couple weeks later and there's another thing that we're all worked up about and and you know a lot we understand where that comes from the media or whatnot but you know maybe it's the environment one week and maybe it's some sort of scandal here and maybe it's ukraine the next week and maybe it's a school shooting the next week or you know he said this and they got into this fight and there's something that they're always piping you know you're supposed to be excited about this you're supposed to be unhappy about that you're supposed to be sad about this you're supposed to go ahead and put your flags at half mass because of this and they expect us to follow their roller coaster of emotions up and down and that was the same thing in jesus day i'm not saying that these things don't deserve thought or attention i'm not saying that there's there's not a place for outrage or there's not a place for fear or concern but i'm pointing out that our society seems to be coordinated on these different topics and, and we focus on whatever the topic of the day is get outraged about this get sad about that what about putting our priority and our focus where god puts it what about putting our priority and our focus on what we know as truth from the word of god i hope that as you go to work or go to work and you sit down amongst your coworkers, or you step up to the line you, you do the work with the people and, and they see you worked up that it isn't something that you saw on tv it isn't something that you you heard on the radio on the way in. It isn't something that you saw in the newspaper, but it's something that you got from the Word of God. Hey, I'll tell you, there are some things that we read in the Word of God that ought to make us that ought to make us excited and happy. There are some things that we read in the Word of God that ought to make us mourn. But we're not on the same roller coaster as the rest of this world. We live according to the truth of God's Word, and it's a different foundation. It's an entirely different base for living. We need to put our focus and our priority where God puts it, or we're going to be at the mercy of our circumstances. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. We understand that, that men deceive, men try and pull us, but behind the scenes we know the great deceiver is the one who coordinates all that. It's easy to get wrapped up in conspiracy theories and find the connection behind the line i'll tell you what i don't care if it's a a cabal or a, a group or an organization behind the scenes is satan pulling the strings behind the scenes is the devil coordinating things and that's who it is we must be careful that we're not living according to what the world and what satan is piping for us think of the 12 spies that were sent back or sent into the promised land we know the story they went in there and you sing the children's song, you know, 10 were bad and two were good, right? And there was a majority of them that were all worked up. They got the masses all worked up. They made God's people, they, they got them worked up in fear, except for two men. We saw Joshua and Caleb. And these, these men, they refused to follow the crowd. They refused to join them in fear. They refused to, to dance when they were told to dance and mourn when they were told to mourn and live in fear when they were told to, to live in fear. They were they were very nearly murdered the bible says that they wanted to take them and they wanted to kill them we see in that passage because they didn't follow the emotions of the masses i just want to remind you today that believer we have a different foundation we have a different worldview we have a different base we have a different source of strength we have jesus christ and we have the word of god that we can rest in that can guide and control us and we ought not be on that same ro roller coaster of emotions that the world is on we see that society complained to Jesus. And they complained to us today. You didn't follow our emotions. The second thing we see, they were unhappy in verse 18. It says, For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, He hath a devil. So we understand they're talking about his the things that he didn't do. We understand in the scriptures it said that he drank neither wine nor nor strong drink there were some things that he was separated from there was a way that he lived that was not the same as everyone else in fact you know when it talks about wine nor strong drink it's talking we understand wine in the scriptures can refer to grape juice and it can refer to uh, alcoholic as well and he's saying they're not even not just the strong drink but he says i don't even want you to mess with wine i don't even want you to mess with the grape juice that was what he was called he was called to separate and, and stay so far away from it that nobody could mistake his unusual separation nobody could deny the fact that he was set apart for a very special purpose he was consecrated to god for the work that god had given him but these people weren't happy about that they wanted him to follow after their lusts they wanted him to follow after 
the way that they lived, neither eating nor drinking. And they looked at him in his separation, and they said, he hath the devil. They said there's no good reason for him to be doing this. He was criticized because he didn't have the same diet as those around him. Why won't you eat and drink with us, John? Why won't you have a little wine? Why won't you have a, a smoke with us? Why won't you give yourself to the pleasures of this world? And the reason was because John had a greater purpose. John had a calling. John had a task. He was separated for a reason. We see in the scriptures here that John was a prophet. He was a herald for the coming Messiah. He, he had a great purpose. He couldn't follow the lusts of this world. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 24. Hebrews eleven twenty four. it says, by faith, Moses. And let me say that living a separated lifestyle, not following the pattern of this world, it requires faith. He says, by faith, faith Moses when he was come to years refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward by faith he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And we see that faith written all throughout. We see it at the beginning. He says, by faith, Moses. We see it in the middle. He says, he had recompense or respect under the recompense of the reward. He looked forward to what had been promised to him. And then we see there at the end, by faith, again, he forsook Egypt, not fearing. And it says, as seeing him who is invisible. Moses, in faith, laid aside the comforts of the palace. Think about who he was. Think about who he was raised by. I don't have time to go back into the, the situation, but we know that the, the Egyptians had enacted a, a genocidal plan to go ahead and kill all the children from the children of Israel. And it sounds funny saying that. Children of, children of Israel, these babies, they wanted to murder them. And so they had this plan, and we see this, this mother of faith and this family of faith that set aside their child, and they refused to allow the world to, to go ahead and take their child, and they raised him. But there came a point where they put Moses inside that ark of bulrushes. They sent him down the river. We know that his sister was watching, and we know that the princess took Moses. We know that he was raised in the palace. He was raised in Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's household. But there was a point at which he set those things aside. There was a point where he came of years, came of age, and he decided, hey, there are some things that I see here that I can't live with. There are some lusts. There are some, there's a lifestyle. There are some things that I have to set aside. I cannot follow the same pattern as these people who do not fear the Lord. And Moses laid aside the advantages of being a part of the royal family. He laid aside the fancy food and drink. He laid aside the wealth. He laid aside what the scriptures call the, the seasonal pleasures of sin. And he refused to follow the lust of those around him. And what did it get him? We see here it got him the wrath of the king. That's what it said there in that passage, not fearing the wrath of the king. And I'll tell you what, when we separate ourselves unto the Lord, and let me just remind you, we don't just separate ourselves from the world. We don't just try to be different. We try to, we separate ourselves unto the Lord for a reason, for a purpose. We see that in John the Baptist. We see that in Moses here. But when we separate ourselves to the Lord, society will put out their wrath on us. They'll, they'll be angry. They do get worked up. We saw it here. We see it in the, the passage we just read. And this world is, is forever creating new ways for us to lust and, and follow after and give of ourselves, our, our time and our effort and our money. They're always coming up with new hobbies. They're always coming up with new sports and new toys and new vehicles and new gadgets and entertainments and selfish pursuits and perversions. And we cannot pursue the lusts that this world calls us to. We're not our own. We're bought with the price, the scriptures tells us, tell us. We need to deny ourselves. Turn with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Verse 23, and he said unto them, he said to them all, 
If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Say that with me. Again, just that phrase. Let him deny himself. Wow. And take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Let him deny himself, we see in the scripture there. You won't see that message on social media today. You don't see that preached in a lot of churches. You won't find that on the news tonight. You're not going to hear the, the people at, at work around the water cooler talking about how to deny themselves. That's not a message that the world puts out. That's not what we're called to by society. That's not what our television tells us or the advertisements or the news. Let him deny himself. Titus 2, verse 11 and 12, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. If we look around today, take an evaluation of our society and what we look around, you don't see much sobriety. You don't. You just look around at the general general society. You don't see much godly living. You don't see much righteousness as we see here. We don't see denial of lust. And we see here that the scriptures call the believer to a different way of life, a different way of living. Romans chapter 1 and verse 12, along the same lines, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We see there, it talks about that sacrifice. And he says in verse two, and be not conformed to this world because a life of sacrifice, a life that's dedicated to Christ is not conformed to the world. It's not in the pattern that this world calls us to, that our society wants us to follow after. And we see that test there at the end that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'll tell you the test of the world nowadays is, does this make me feel good? Does this please my flesh does this serve me does this make my life easier you go on and answer all those questions that that feed the flesh and the test of the believer is different the test of the believer says what is good and profitable about this the test of the believer says is this an acceptable sacrifice to god is this the will of god that we know according to the truth of scriptures because we have a different way of life it causes the world to cry out and complain you see first of all they they cry out you didn't follow our emotions we see secondly they they cry out you didn't follow our lusts but the last thing here and i think this is one of the more serious even in verse 19 not just john here but they're talking about jesus now in verse 19 of matthew chapter 11 he says the son of man came eating and drinking talking about himself behold a man, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Let me just answer, first of all, <laughs> it's clear, it's clear. Was Jesus gluttonous? No, he wasn't. Was Jesus a wine-bibber? No. They were saying things that were patently false. They were, they were, they were complaining, though, about Jesus. And, and even in their complaining, they exaggerated and they were untrue. But they were, they were saying, you shouldn't be eating and drinking, Jesus. They were telling John the Baptist that he was too separated. And then they came over here, and they were telling Jesus that he wasn't separated enough. You, you, you got to, <laughs> I don't know, there is no perfect balance. There is no way that you can please him here. But they were claiming that Jesus was, was gluttonous. They said, you should be more ascetic. And they had their idea of what Jesus should be doing. You should, you should live in the desert. Maybe they expected Jesus to be eating uh, wild locusts or locusts and wild honey. I, I, I don't know exactly what they expected of him, but they were not happy with his diet. They were not happy with the way that he was living. Maybe they expected him to fast. Maybe they expected him to be wearing worn out clothing. Maybe they, they obviously didn't expect him. They didn't want him to be a friend of publicans and, and sinners. And here they were correcting Jesus. Think about that for a minute. They were telling God what he should be doing. 
They were telling God what, what God would really want. And, and we see that today in our society. This world has an idea of what they think religion looks like. They have an idea in their mind of what they think piety looks like. They have an idea of what they think uh, the power of God should look like. Maybe it looks like cathedrals and fancy buildings with stained glass. Maybe in their mind it looks like uh, statue, statues. Maybe it looks like sacrifices in some way. Maybe it looks like a choir swaying with their eyes closed. They have their idea of what religion looks like in their own mind. And I'll tell you, it doesn't line up with the scripture. And they complain about truth. I think of the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. They stood atop Mount Carmel in their contest in 1 Kings chapter 18. They were having this contest to see who could get their God to light their sacrifice on fire. The false prophets had their idea of what was necessary to get the power of their little G gods. And, and they had the numbers. The Bible tells us that they had 450 prophets. Now, surely they were doing what was right. They had, they had the majority on their side. And they sat there and they called out. They prayed, the Bible says, long and and pious prayers from, from morning till noon, the scriptures tell us. They were praying, trying to get their, their gods to answer. They leapt and they, they danced upon the altar. They cut themselves with knives and lancets, the Bible says, till the blood gushed out. And that's pretty descriptive there. They had their idea of what was needed to get the power of God. I'll tell you what, you look at those things, that's, that's sacrifice right there. They were doing something. I'll say there's a lot of what they were doing that lines up with what a lot of churches nowadays think is a religious experience that they should be doing. But when Elijah came up, it was his turn. He didn't copy the prophets. He didn't put on a show for the people. He didn't make it look fancy. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll bet there were people that came that day that were disappointed. They were disappointed with the way that Elijah was going. What? He's not doing a long and pious prayer. He's not, he's not dancing around in the altar. He's not cutting himself. But he came out the way that God wanted him to. And that's the important thing. He came out with a simple prayer of faith. You counted out, it was 63 words, just two verses long. We understand it wasn't the prayer itself, but it was the faith. And the scripture says that the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the sacrifice. It consumed the wood. It consumed the stones. It consumed the, the dust. It consumed all the water. He had the power of God, even though it didn't look like what the world thought it should look like. The world has their idea of what religion looks like. But we have to come to God the way that he commands. We don't need to take our idea of what religion is and what God wants us to do from a priest or a prophet or even a preacher. We take it from God's word. We take it from the word of God. That's how we are directed. We knock on doors and we talk to a lot of folks that claim to have the assurance of, of heaven as their home. Oh, yeah, I, I know that. That's something I, I know for sure. You ask them, what is it that, that gives you that confidence? If you were to tell someone else, how how'd you, well, it's because I've lived a good life. It's because I'm a good person and I pray every night. It's because I, I attend church and I, I've done it from the time I was just a, a, a child. And, and the, the world has their idea of what God expects. They have their idea of what piety looks like. They have their idea of what righteousness looks like, of what godly religion looks like. And they have no idea what the truth is. How many times have we heard as, as believers, if you were a real Christian, you would fill in the blank. If you were a real Christian, you would, you would put your stamp of approval upon the LGBTQ going down the alphabet. You, you would put your stamp of approval on that. that. That's what the world tells us. That's what's supposed to be done, right? If you were a real Christian, you would get worked up about the same things that we are. If you were a real Christian, and they go on, they don't understand what real religion looks like, what piety looks like. And, and I'll tell you, it's based on humanistic worldview. It's based on something that they have been given by Satan, the great deceiver. He's the one who wants to keep people from truth. And in his mind, he doesn't care if he's getting someone to follow after the uh, Muslim religion. He doesn't care if he's getting someone to, to follow after Hinduism. He doesn't care if he's getting to follow after a variation of the gospel, a false gospel that varies in just one way. He doesn't care. All he's trying to do is get them to have a false view so that they will not trust Jesus Christ for salvation. 
Salvation is not through works. It's not through living a righteous life. It's, it's not through church attendance or memorizing the Bible or attending or working in the local church. The scriptures tell us that salvation is by grace through faith alone. And one day, each one of us will stand before God and give an answer for his or her life. And it's not going to be according to what our pastor said. It's not going to be according to what the world said that religion should look like and what you should be doing. You're not going to be able to look around you to society to give you support. At that point, you're going to have to give an answer for yourself according to the truth of the word of God. And we have to make sure that we are not swayed by this world's view of piety and religion. We must stand on truth. We see our society in the same way as it did for Jesus. Complaining, whining. You didn't follow our emotions. You didn't follow after our lusts. You didn't follow our example of, of piety and what we think religion should look like. Today I want to say, believer, don't listen to the complaints of the wicked. Don't be drawn into their lifestyle. We are different. We serve a different master. We have a different foundation. We are children of God. We're children of light. We're his. Don't try to, to pretend otherwise. Don't try to live a life according to the way that the world pipes and mourns and tries to get us to follow. Don't listen to the complaints of the wicked. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the warnings that we see here in the scripture. What a timeless message. It was there for you when you walked the, the earth. And it's something that we have to deal with today. Lord, I pray that you would please give us strength to stand for what's right. Strength to come back to the scriptures and let that be our basis for living in every area. The way that we live, the way that we work, our relationships, our families, every bit of it, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name.